Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to talk about Russian oil exports and ask the question as to whether or not Russia is actually being paid by all of the counterparties that it's currently exporting oil to. It was recently revealed that Venezuela, who've been subject to the same sort of sanctions that Russia are currently subject to since 2019, have not been paid for around 85% of all of the oil that it's been exporting. And one of the reasons that Venezuela hasn't been paid is that because it's no longer able to access all of the traditional markets, it's been forced to use agents and black markets. And those agents have subsequently just not paid the money across to Venezuela. So in today's episode, we'll have a look at the latest oil export data for Russia. We'll see which countries they're actually exporting to now. And we'll talk about both the credit risk for those countries, because some of them are on the verge of bankruptcy, if not already in bankruptcy, and also the risks of using the black markets. We'll have a look at what's happening with refined oil sales, the sale of gasoline, diesel, kerosene, all of the refined products, because as I've mentioned in previous videos, these products are not attractive to countries like India and China because they've got their own refinery network. So they would rather buy the cheaper crude oil and refine it themselves rather than the finished products. And this represents another major problem from Russia's perspective. We'll then have a look at what's happened in Venezuela, the details of why they haven't been paid and whether or not this represents a genuine risk from Russia's perspective. And then we'll have a look at a recent article where it's reported that President Putin has admitted that the sanctions will have a major impact on the Russian economy. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think is likely to happen for Russian oil sales over the course of the next three to six months and what the impact of that will be on the Russian economy. Now, before we go on any further today, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, Galaxy Lamps, and their amazing Easter sale, where for a very limited time only, they are offering 50% off plus an extra 20% off. And in addition to that, Joe Blogs viewers will have a chance to be amongst the first 10 to get the new limited edition projector worth almost $200 completely free before it goes live on the website. Now I have one of these Galaxy Lamps and they are super cool. They instantly create a vibe and atmosphere in any room and can brighten up your party or create romantic and chilled atmospheres and are even perfect for helping you get to sleep. But you'll need to be quick to grab this offer because it ends on the 10th of April. So to buy your Galaxy Lamp now, please click in the link below. This chart shows the value of Russian crude oil exports between January 2022 and the 19th of March 2023. And the scale on the left hand side of this chart is measured in hundreds of millions of euros per day. And if we look at the colour coding of each section from the bottom up, the light blue section at the bottom represents sales to the European Union, the yellow section represents sales to Egypt, the orange section represents sales to India, the grey section is a collection of other countries, the green section at the top is Turkey, and the purple section are not disclosed. If we start off by looking at the current value of sales, it's coming in at around 250 million euros. And if you look back to the start of this chart, you can see that that's broadly speaking the level of sales that Russia was achieving before the invasion of Ukraine started. However, if we look at the makeup of those sales, it's very different today. Back in January 2022, 50% of all of the crude oil sales that Russia was achieving were going directly to the European Union. And the other largest customer that Russia had, which is included in the other section of this chart, was China, which represented around 30% of all of the exports. Egypt and India represented a very small percentage. If we look at the breakdown today, it's entirely different. The European Union brought in an outright ban on the purchase of all Russian crude oil on the 5th of December. And you can see that that point is marked on this chart with the dotted vertical line. And after that point, all sales to the EU disappeared completely. There was a short lag when there were some sales that were actually made before the 5th of December that were allowed to be delivered. But as you can see from the latest data, the blue line has almost disappeared. Now, in terms of breaking down the latest sales data, this chart shows the five biggest importers of Russian fossil fuels between the 13th of March and the 19th of March. And you can see that the biggest single buyer is China, who paid around $1.5 billion to Russia during that seven-day period. The second and third biggest buyers were India and Turkey, who paid around $600 million during that seven-day period. The fourth biggest buyer was actually the European Union, who paid around $500 million. And the fifth largest buyer was the United Arab Emirates. Now let's look at the breakdown of those purchases and specifically how much crude oil China and India were buying. Now in terms of the breakdown of the purchases that China has made, 
you can see that the biggest single section was crude oil that was delivered by the pipeline. And this relates to the ESPO pipeline that delivers oil from Russia directly into China. In the seven days ending 19th of March, China purchased around 500 million euros of oil through the pipeline, which equates to around 70 million euros per day. And if we compare that to oil that was purchased over the sea, that came in at around 300 million for the week, which equates to around 45 million euros of oil per day. So in total, over this seven day period, China was purchasing around 115 million euros of oil per day from Russia. If we now look at the situation for India, obviously no pipeline exists between Russia and India, so all of the oil sales are seaborne. And in those seven days, India purchased around 250 million euros of oil, which equates to around 35 million euros per day. So the summary here is that in this seven day period, India and China combined were purchasing around 150 million euros of oil per day. If we now go back to the total sales chart, it shows that Russia was selling around 250 million euros per day of oil. So that means the oil valued at 100 million euros per day was being sold to other countries. Now, in terms of which of those other countries, the ones that are shown on this table are Egypt and Turkey. However, we're aware that Russia is also providing oil to countries such as Sri Lanka and Pakistan. And one of the big questions that I want to investigate in this video is whether or not Russia is actually being paid any cash for those oil deliveries. If you've been following the channel, you'll be fully aware that there are a lot of countries right now who are struggling for cash. As a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, we saw commodity prices rise dramatically all around the world. And that put real pressure on countries that are net importers. Anybody that was importing large amounts of fuel and food, the price of all of those items went up dramatically. The strength of the dollar also went up, which had a double whammy impact because for a lot of countries, they were having to pay in US dollars and their own currency devalued. So this was a real nightmare for a lot of countries and it's left many of them on the verge of bankruptcy. I've recently posted videos talking about the crisis in Pakistan, Cuba, Sri Lanka and Turkey. And those four countries are amongst the group that Russia has turned to to try to export more oil. So obviously from Russia's point of view, there is a benefit for sending that oil because it allows them to keep drawing the oil out of the ground and keep everything moving with the oil industry. But if those countries are not able to actually pay for that oil, is there any point in doing that business in the long term? This chart shows the weekly sales of refined oil products from Russia between January 22 and the 19th of March 2023. And once again, this chart is measured in millions of euros and we've got the same color coding system. Now, in terms of the total volume of sale, it was recorded at around 130 million euros for the week ending 19th of March. And that represents a fall from where Russia was before the invasion of Ukraine started. In January, it was achieving sales of around 150 million euros per day. However, those sales increased dramatically following the invasion as a result of the increase in oil prices. And in March 2022, Russia was achieving around 220 million euros of sales per day. Now, since that high point, the value of sales have fallen. And you can see that the biggest single section in this chart that has reduced in size is the European Union. And on the 5th of February, the European Union brought in an outright ban on the purchase of all refined products. And you can see that the sales have dropped dramatically since then. There are still some sales going through which relate to orders that were placed before the 5th of February that haven't been delivered yet. But over the course of the next month or so, those sales will reduce to zero. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, one of the problems that Russia is facing here is that India and China, its two biggest markets for crude oil, are not interested in buying large quantities of refined products. And the reasons for that are firstly, it's more expensive. So they would rather buy the crude oil than paying a premium for the finished products. And secondly, both India and China have their own refinery networks. The vast majority of major economies around the world have built their own oil refineries. You don't actually need to be producing oil yourself to be able to refine it. And by refining it yourself, you're firstly creating employment in your country because you can build up an industry around this. And secondly, you can make sure that all of the refined products that are produced from crude oil meet your market demands. So you can set up your processes exactly as you want. 
And thirdly, and probably most importantly, there is money to be made from this. Because if you refine crude oil, you also have the option of selling those finished products to other countries. You don't have to use it all yourself. So there's actually a middleman margin to be made by becoming an oil refiner. And that's why India and China are not interested in buying large quantities of gasoline and diesel and other finished products from Russia. They would rather buy more crude oil pass it through their own refineries and then either use that oil in their own markets or sell it to other countries. And that's exactly what India and China have been doing. And there have actually been some questions raised as to whether or not India is refining Russian crude oil and then selling those finished products on to countries that are actually sanctioning Russia. So the loss of the sales to the European Union is creating a major headache from Russia's perspective. They're needing to find replacement markets, and this is very difficult. And if we look at the breakdown of the sales that have been disclosed as of the 19th of March, you can see that the only significant country that's been identified as buying large amounts of that refined oil is Turkey. The cream section of this graph refers to future orders, so we don't know who those orders are from. The grey section refers to other countries and the purple section is undisclosed. So we don't really know where Russia is delivering all of that refined product to, but there is a major question as to whether or not they will be paid for any of that because the countries who have the highest demand for refined products right now are the countries who are sitting on the verge of bankruptcy. So countries such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Egypt and Cuba will be very happy to take delivery of large quantities of refined products, but will they ever have the cash to be able to pay for them? It's been reported that middlemen have left Venezuela's main oil company with $21.2 billion worth of unpaid bills. When the United States first imposed oil sanctions on PDVSA in 2019, in an effort to oust the country's leader after a re-election was denounced as a sham by opponents, PDVSA turned to units of Russian oil firm Rosneft to trade most of its sales to Asia and to compensate for the loss of its main market, the USA. But unfortunately for Venezuela, those Rosneft units then faced sanctions themselves by the US Treasury Department in 2020, which forced PDVSA to resort to using a Mexican-based network of intermediaries that were also sanctioned by Washington, and later to dozens of lesser-known middlemen, which exacerbated the failed payment issue. Venezuela's state-run oil company, PDVSA, has accumulated $21.2 billion in accounts receivable after turning to dozens of little-known intermediaries three years ago to export its oil in the face of US sanctions. And these unpaid accounts receivable account to around 84% of the total amount of oil that Venezuela has shipped, according to the documents provided to the Office of Venezuela's Attorney General during a long-standing audit of PDVSA's contracts. Out of a total of $25.27 billion in oil exports between January 2020 and March 2023, PDVSA was only able to confirm the receipt of $4.08 billion in payments, excluding some swaps like the one with Cuba. The $21.2 billion in commercial accounts receivables includes around $3.6 billion of potentially unrecoverable bills tied to tankers that left the country without prepaying at least a portion of the cargo's value, even though customers had agreed to those terms. The accounts receivable also includes an outstanding balance to be paid by Iran for its receipt of cargoes from Venezuela since 2020 as part of an oil swap between the two countries. It stated that some customers have challenged PDVSA's count of failed payments by providing supporting documents that had not been registered with the state company's contract administration system. So basically these customers are saying that the paperwork has not been done correctly and therefore they're refusing to pay. During the audit, PDVSA's Department of International Finances and Accountability said that according to documentation registered by the company's contract system, executives at the Trade and Supply Division had been authorising cargoes to leave Venezuelan waters without completing the payment verification process. The scale of the receivables problem explains a January freeze on supply contracts by PDVSA's new boss, Pedro Telecha, who sought to halt unpaid cargoes immediately after taking office, a series of attempts to tighten contract terms came after some vessels absconded without payment in recent years. Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, recently accepted the resignation of the oil minister, who served the government for two decades, amid a corruption probe focused on PDVSA and the judiciary. In recent days, the investigation has resulted in the jailing of dozens of officials. PDVSA's former vice president of supply and trade, Antonio Perez Suarez, 
and about 20 executives who worked for him have been arrested, according to people familiar with the matter. So what we're seeing coming out of Venezuela is a combination of different factors. Because of the sanctions that were applied by the USA in 2019, Venezuela had limited options in terms of where it was able to sell its oil. Initially, it looked to Russia to help out and was trying to direct all of its sales through the Russian business Rosneft. However, as that entity then became sanctioned itself, that cut off that supply chain from Venezuela's point of view. It then went to Mexico, but unfortunately the US authorities were following exactly what was happening and they subsequently sanctioned those Mexican businesses because they didn't want to allow all of this Venezuelan oil to simply enter the world markets through a third party subsidiary. And as a result of that, Venezuela has been forced to go deeper into the black market to be able to sell its oil. And unfortunately from Venezuela's point of view, what they found is that these black market agents are not trustworthy and a lot of them haven't actually paid for the oil. They've organized the customers and the delivery, but not the payment. And that's obviously the risk for any country or company when you're blocked from using the main markets. But it also does appear that there's been a high level of incompetence and corruption going on in Venezuela as well. It's reported that some customers are refusing to pay because they're saying that documentation doesn't exist and therefore they're not prepared to make those payments. But from the resignations and the arrests that we've seen so far, it would also appear to be the case that there's corruption going on. So it's a multifaceted problem that Venezuela is facing right now. And in terms of whether or not this could apply to Russia, well, obviously, when you're dealing with black markets, when you're moving away from the normal distribution channels, there is always a risk in terms of payment. And then when you layer on top of that, the fact that Russia is currently supplying a lot of countries that are in major financial difficulty, countries such as Pakistan, Cuba, Sri Lanka, and Turkey, that throws a bigger question mark in terms of whether or not those countries actually have any foreign currency, whether they have the ability to pay. They may want to pay, they may have the intention of actually paying for that oil, but do they actually have the cash to be able to pay for large quantities of Russian oil? It's been reported that President Putin of Russia has conceded that Western sanctions designed to starve the Kremlin of funds for its invasion of Ukraine could deal a blow to Russia's economy. It was reported by Russian state news agency TASS that in a televised interview, President Putin stated, the illegitimate restrictions imposed on the Russian economy may indeed have a negative impact on it in the medium term. Now, this is obviously a surprise turn of direction for President Putin, because up until now, he has categorically stated that the sanctions will have no impact and that Russia will come out stronger at the end of this conflict and that the West are the ones who are suffering the most as a result of the economic sanctions that have been applied against Russia. However, even though this has been reported by TASS, I think it's unlikely that President Putin will change his tone. I don't think we'll see a running commentary on this situation. I doubt that he will say that Russia is suffering on a regular basis. However, I'll keep you posted if there's any further news and any more statements from President Putin. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video really to give you an update on what's happening with regards to Russian oil, because Russian oil is absolutely critical to the success of the Russian economy. It's the heartbeat. It represents around 50% of all of the external revenue that Russia is drawing in. And of course, the sanctions are having a major impact on Russia. It's had to change its focus entirely and find new markets. And as you've seen from the figures that we've been through today, Russia is managing to find countries to take delivery of that oil. But one of the big questions is, will it be paid for that oil? Are the counterparties that Russia is dealing with credit worthy? And do they have enough foreign currency exchange to actually be able to make those payments? Because it's one thing to agree a deal to deliver large amounts of oil, but it's another thing to actually get paid. Now, if Russia was a company and you were doing analysis, you were looking at what's happening within that business, you would have to identify that the credit worthiness of the customer base that it's working with today is worse than it was 12 months ago. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, its biggest single market was the European Union. And that group of countries includes some of the largest economies in the world. So from a customer analysis point of view, that's exactly the sort of customers you want. They're cash rich, they need your product, and they will keep paying because they want to keep receiving deliveries. So that is perfect from a business perspective. But when you look at where Russia is today, it's lost all of those customers. So 50% of its clients have gone. 
and they've replaced those customers partly with India and China, both of whom do have cash, so there's no problem with that. However, a big portion of the lost sales from the European Union have been replaced by much smaller countries who are sitting on the verge of bankruptcy. So countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka and Egypt are all seeking bailouts at the moment from the IMF. They're going cap in hand, saying we really need some help and assistance because we've run out of money and we can't afford to feed our people. And these are the countries that Russia is getting into bed with in terms of making large deliveries of oil. So when you look at it in that context, you have to think that the credit risk from Russia's perspective has increased dramatically over the course of the last 12 months. And realistically, it's unlikely that it will receive actual payment for the delivery of oil to those countries. So Russia will then be posed with the question as to what do they do about it? Do they just allow these countries to build up large debts with Russia and owe them huge amounts of money? Or will Russia want to negotiate and talk about some other form of arrangement? Now, if you follow the channel, you'll know that China has been investing into a lot of these cash-strapped countries over the course of the last 10 years or so. The Chinese Belt and Road Initiative was designed to help build infrastructure in a variety of different countries. But the way that China structured those deals, they were set up as debt. So those countries actually owed the money back to China. And a few years ago, we had a very interesting situation with regards to Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka, which had been built by China. Sri Lanka was unable to keep up the repayments on that loan. And as a result of that, China negotiated a 99-year lease. And China now owns that portion of Sri Lanka. And as I mentioned before, that's raised security concerns for India, which is located very close to Sri Lanka, and also the USA, because they're worried that China could set up a military base on that land. And the reason for mentioning that is that these countries getting into more and more debt with Russia opens up the possibility that Russia could have similar negotiations. Rather than receiving payments in cash for its oil, it may decide that it wants to negotiate a similar sort of deal that China have done with Sri Lanka, or some other form of arrangement whereby Russia is paid in other goods or services. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, this is absolutely crazy. Why would Russia send large quantities of oil to these countries that it knows full well don't have any cash and therefore will never be able to make those payments? And the reason that Russia is doing this is that it needs to keep finding somewhere to send that oil to. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that we've talked a lot about the production problems that Russia is facing. It's lost its business partners. So companies such as BP, Shell and ExxonMobil have all left the country. So it no longer has access to their expertise to be able to sort out any problems. And the last thing that Russia wants to do at the moment is to reduce its output. Russia have already announced that it's cut back 500,000 barrels of oil per day from its production but it doesn't want to keep doing that because the more you cut back on production the more likely it is that you will have problems in the future because when you stem the flow of oil it can lead to that oil clogging up under the ground and then when you want to increase production in the future it might not happen you may find that everything starts to jam up and you've got major issues particularly because a lot of these fields are in areas that have very cold climates so the last thing that Russia wants to do at the moment is to continue slashing its production. And the only way that it can keep production going at the same level is by selling the oil to other countries because it simply doesn't have anywhere to store it. So doing deals with countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Turkey and Cuba does actually benefit Russia because it allows that production to keep flowing. Whether or not they ever get paid for that oil is a completely different question. Now, in terms of the impact on Russia's economy, obviously, if it's not being paid for the oil that it's selling, it's not going to receive the cash. And over the next three to six months, that will put further pressure on the Russian economy. In 2022, the Russian economy incurred a deficit of $48 billion. And in the first two months of 23, they've incurred a similar deficit. So things are going very badly at the moment in the Russian economy. And if they're not getting paid for their oil, then that is going to get worse. And Russia has had to dip into its national wealth fund to be able to fund those deficits. And if that situation continues through the course of 2023, at some point Russia will run out of cash because it's not unlimited. The National Wealth Fund is currently sitting at around $150 billion. But if Russia loses $150 billion this year, then that would mean that they would wipe out their entire National Wealth Fund. So at some point Russia does need to get paid for this oil. 
If those countries are unable to pay for it, then Russia will need to find some other way of extracting value out of those contracts if it's going to avoid running out of cash in 2023. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode, you found it useful, informative and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. And thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.